Yeah, this really is the most wonderful time of the year, and, uh, and not just for all the reasons that that song talks about, but I was just reflecting on that today. This is just such a beautiful time, and I'm excited for what we'll experience together today, and then I'm excited as we move into next week and our Christmas celebrations, and, and then just celebrating Jesus and uh, just His coming to rescue us. It's just so beautiful, such a marvelous story. Excited to be a part of that. Excited to be part of the end of this series as we wrap up Christmas at the movies. This has been a fun little journey together as we've watched the movies together and talked about some different themes that we see throughout some of those classic Christmas movies. And I'm excited today to, uh, to, to bring you probably a favorite movie, certainly a classic, much more of a classic than Elf, wouldn't you agree? I'm not sure how that got weaseled in there, but, but this one this Charles Dickens Christmas Carol, just a fantastic story, uh, just so many movie adaptations of it. I don't know if you've read the book or not, but when I saw that I, I'd have this weekend, I actually found a free version of the book on Kindle and read the book. It's just a fantastic story, and, and just you're probably familiar with it, and you, as you know, there are just dozens, probably hundreds of different movie adaptations of it, different uh, stage adaptations of it, and so no surprise, I decided to go with the one that has the most memorable character some quirky ones, some hilarious ones. And so I'm going with the Muppets Christmas Carol. Let me hear it for that. Yeah. Yeah, I know you like that, right? That is what I'm talking about. Ebenezer Scrooge. And some of us, some of us get to spend all the work week with that guy, you know? And it's just a trip, okay? So you can just feast on that eye candy and uh, then we'll, we'll move on, see? Somebody gets the last laugh here, huh? <laughs> but you're familiar with the story, Ebenezer Scrooge, and, and I just want to give you a couple snapshots from, from the, the movie. And first, I want you to see really the opening scene in the movie where we get this glimpse of who this guy is, like who is Ebenezer Scrooge, and, and we see him really at his worst. I mean, he's really become the worst possible version of himself. So take a look at a couple minutes from the beginning of The Muppet's Christmas Carol. Whew. That is one grumpy Grinch of a guy, isn't it? Man, uh, this, this line didn't make it into the movie, but listen, this is a quote from Dickens' story, and, and he's quoting uh, as, as Scrooge talks to his nephew, and the nephew wishes him Merry Christmas, and Scrooge says, Merry Christmas, out upon Merry Christmas. If I could work my will, in other words, if I could have my way, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with a Merry Christmas on their lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart, he should. Wow. Boy, tell us how you really feel, Ebenezer. I mean, this guy is just cold, and he's hard, and he's greedy, and he's tight-fisted. And we get this glimpse of him that, honestly, if we think about it, I, I don't really think that deep down, this is who Scrooge wants to be, right? This is not the guy he wanted to grow up and become one day. I don't think that, that even Scrooge is that pleased with this version of himself. You know what I mean? I mean, he gets a glimpse of who he is, and, and he can't admit it now, but as the movie goes on, he starts to. But he gets this glimpse, and he says, boy, that guy that, that I am, that guy that I used to be, that's not who I want to be. And I wonder if you can relate with that. I wonder if you've ever gotten glimpses of yourself and you've said, man, that's not who I want to be. You know, what was that? What was that that just came out of my mouth? What was that that I'm doing, you know? That's not, that's not the version of myself that I had hoped for. Does that sound familiar? It happens to me far too often, I, I must add, you know, and, and especially if I'm being honest, especially kind of in the way that I interact with my kids. Right? There'll be these moments, and, and all that's coming out of me is just impatience and anger and frustration. And, you know, I might be tired or might have a lot on, and so I take it out on them. And I, and I get this glimpse of myself, and I'm like, really? Seriously? I mean, is that who I want to be? I mean, there's times where, you know, can we have some ice cream? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of ice cream. Can we have some? No, no sprinkles on it. What are you, crazy? No sprinkles. You should have broccoli on it if I got my way. Quiet down, you know, and no laughing, no fooling around, no playing around, you know. And I'm thinking, really? I mean, they're not allowed to laugh or play. Or, I mean, they're just being kids. And I get these glimpses of myself, and I'm like, seriously? Is that who you want to be? And, and I wonder if you've been there too, right? I wonder if you've been there as you, as you take a snapshot of your life, and maybe all you see is this guy or this lady who is uh, passionate about their work and giving lots of their time and their energy and their resources to their career, 
with precious little left over for their family. And, and you really, you get that glimpse and you're like, really, is that who I want to be? Right, or maybe if you were to take just a glimpse of your, of your, your web browsing history, you know, and the, the websites and how much time you spend surfing and, and the sites that you seem to frequent more than others. And, and if you could just take that snapshot, really? I mean, is that who I want to be? Is that what I want to be spending my time on? Is that what I want to be devoting my passion to? Or maybe as you think about your relationships, right? You think about the people that make up your life and that are part of your world. And are they people that are sharpening you? Are they people that are making you more into the person you want to be? Or maybe on the flip side, you're, you're just only around, you know, a cloistered group of people that all believe and think alike, and you really have no redemptive influence in the world, and you have no, you know, giving out and, and, and giving to others. Maybe here's a good one. Sorry if I step on some toes, but not too long from now, right, we'll, we'll all be putting together our, our year-end financial materials, right? And not long from now, there will be a specific number that you're going to have to write down and say, this is how generous I was in 2013. And there's really no you know, quibbling about it. You're going to have to write down a specific number. And, and that snapshot right there, some of you may be thrilled with that. And some of you may say, really? I mean, is that, with all that God's given to me, is that really the picture of me that I want? You know, I don't know what it may be for you. Maybe it's your, your volunteerism or how you, you live your life. I mean, is your calendar and your checkbook and your time, is that all about you or, or are there sufficient and are you pleased with how much you're, you're giving back to others? And so I don't know what it is, but I bet that we've all been somewhere near where Ebenezer Scrooge is and we get the snapshot of ourselves and, and that me, that's not the me that I really want to be, right? That, that who we are or who we used to be, that's not who we want to be. And so we wonder if that can change. We wonder if that's, if that's going to stay that way. And I love this, this question that Scrooge asks. He says, are these the shadows of things that will be or the shadows of things that may be only? Right? Because sometimes we come to a point where who we are and who we used to be, that's not who we want to be. And we come to that moment and we wonder like Scrooge does, is this how it has to be? Or is this just how it might be? Is it possible to change? Can I be a better version of myself? Is there hope for someone like me? And Scrooge wonders that. And just a little spoiler alert, I'm going to kind of zip you all the way to the end of the movie and show you the transformation that took place in Scrooge's life. So take a look at this clip. Yeah. We should just watch the rest of the movie and forget the rest of me, huh? <laughs> no, you seem a lot more excited about that than I had hoped, but Okay. <laughs> But I love that movie, and I love what happens there at the end. Who we used to be isn't who he has to be. There is hope. There is change. There is transformation, and we see it in his life. And I bet you're wondering, yeah, but that's just a story. Could that really happen to me? Is that possible? You know, can, can I have that same kind of turnaround? Because I've had those moments where I'm the worst version of myself, and we begin to wonder, is that what I'm destined for, or is it possible to change? And I've got such great news for you. That kind of transformation that you just saw, that's the kind of stuff Jesus does all the time. That's really all he does. That's why he came, so that he could get us off the dead end road that we're on and get us back on the right track, reconnect us with God, and form us into the person we're supposed to be. That's why Jesus came. That's what we're celebrating this week. There were so many examples of this. I seriously, I had so many examples of where Jesus interacts with people and their life just takes a 180. And I, I honestly had trouble deciding which one to zero in on. And so what I did is pack most of them inside the app notes. And so you can spend all week looking at different people as they interact with Jesus and their life just takes a complete U-turn. What I want to do today is just look at one of them. His name is Matthew. Like Ebenezer Scrooge, Matthew used to have this death grip of greed around his heart. And he was just driven by, by money and by power and by getting more and more. And then Matthew meets Jesus and everything changes. Let me show you his story. It's in Matthew chapter 9. It's there on your note sheet. It'll also be on the screens. Matthew chapter 9. As Jesus went on from here, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now let me just pause there because that phrase is pregnant with meaning. That phrase isn't just telling us where Matthew was physically. It's telling us the condition of his heart spiritually. 
right? Because when we know that Matthew was a tax collector, you need to understand a little bit about that profession in the first century. You need to understand that the people of Israel, God's people, the Jewish people, they were just a little minority group that was enveloped by the Roman Empire. And so they tried to keep their own identity. They tried to live their own, their own customs and their traditions and their laws, but they were oppressed. They were under the thumb of the Roman Empire. And the Romans oppressed them and mistreated them, and they heavily taxed them. And instead of sending Romans to extract these taxes from the Jewish people, the Romans just bribed other Jews to become tax collectors. They just said, if we give you enough money, why don't you come work for us and in essence betray your own people? And so all the tax collectors, they were Jewish and they had to give a certain amount back to Rome and anything more that they could take from people, they got to line their own pockets with. And so tax collectors are like the worst of the worst. They are backstabbing, greedy bunch, only thinking of themselves, betraying their own people, God's people. They're just bad guys. And so, like I said, when, when we read that Matthew is sitting at the tax collector's booth, we don't just find out the location of his body, but we find out the condition of his heart. And this is a glimpse of his life where who he was was not who he wanted to be. I guarantee you as a little boy, little Matt didn't start, you know, one day I'd love to turn my back on God's people and, you know, extort them and steal from them. Like this was not who he wanted to be. And yet he becomes that worst version of himself, and some of us can relate with that. But everything changes when he meets Jesus. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. In that moment, Matthew's life takes a U-turn. He does a complete 180. He goes from, from you know, evil Ebenezer to, to great Uncle Scrooge. Right? He has this turnaround that's just unbelievable. And we see his life change in that moment. And, and you go on and we see that Matthew becomes one of Jesus' closest followers. Matthew becomes part of this, this small band of friends that stick with Jesus right to the end. In fact, even after Jesus is crucified, Matthew continues in, in following him and in spreading his news until he himself is killed for his faith. But it's a complete turnaround from living for himself or living for greed to living for others and embracing this identity and this purpose that God has for his life. That's what happens when people meet Jesus. The same thing that happened to Ebenezer happened to Matthew, and it happened countless other times through the scriptures. I wish we had the time, but you can do, check it out with your app notes. Zacchaeus was in a similar situation, a tax collector like Matthew, and you ought to read about his story and how he turns around from greed to generosity. You'll read about this woman caught in adultery, right? I mean, clearly not who she wants to be, clearly not the finest moment of her life, and yet Jesus offers forgiveness and invites her to turn around and go and sin no more. That's what Jesus does. He does the same thing to this guy named Saul who made his life's work to persecute and kill Christians, and then Saul meets Jesus, and what happens? A 180-degree shift, and his life is turned upside down. These aren't in the app notes, but think about Peter who turns his back on Jesus and, and then comes back and is forgiven and, and sent out as one of the leaders of the early church. Think about Thomas. Think about this guy who's a, who's a convicted criminal. He's being executed right next to Jesus, this thief on the cross. All his life has not gone the right direction. And in his dying breath, he calls out to Jesus. And just like that, his life turns around. You see what I'm talking about? I mean, that's what Jesus did all the time. Matthew figured out that who I am and who I used to be isn't who I have to be. There is hope for a difference. There is hope for change when we meet Jesus. Here's what you need to understand. Jesus, he's the turning point. He is the turning point of history, and he is the turning point of your story. Right? It's, no, it's no mistake that we now change all our calendars, all our system of even you know, judging time and tracking history at the birth of this child. And I bet that in your own life, you could change everything based on the time that he entered into your life. There was this whole time before him, and then there's this time after him, and they are drastically different. That's what Jesus does. He is the turning point. Who we are and who we used to be isn't who we have to be. And some of you need to hear this today. Your past does not have to define your present or determine your future. 
Your past does not have to define your present or determine your future. Jesus is here to change all that. Jesus is here to rewrite the plot of your story. He came so that he could transpose the score of your song, so that he can offer an alternate ending to the film of your life, so that he could alter the trajectory of your very existence. Jesus is bigger than your history, and he is ready to chart a new destiny. And no matter what your past is like, no matter what your history, no matter what, how bad the be- worst version of yourself has looked, you don't have to stay that way. Who we are and who we used to be isn't who we have to be. If I could only get you to remember one thing, it would be this. Your past doesn't have to last. Your past doesn't have to last. That's why Jesus came to turn everything around, to give us a future that is drastically different than our past. Your past doesn't have to last. And it is not too late for you to do what God wants you to do. And it is not too late for you to be who God wants you to be. If he can do that kind of stuff to Matthew and to Peter and to Paul and to the thief and to the woman, if we can see that on Ebenezer Scrooge, that same life change, that's what he offers to you. Your past doesn't have to last. I want you to embrace that. I want you to know that that's for you. And this Christmas, when you, when you celebrate Jesus is coming into this world, I want you to remember that that is why he came, to alter the trajectory of your life, to redeem what's been lost, to forgive what's been broken, to restore what we've done. That's why he came. And so if I can just urge you, if you've not done this already, turn to the Savior. Turn to the Savior, invite him to forgive your past, to enter into your present, to forge a new future. Turn to him, accept him, embrace him, begin to follow him. And then let me tell you this, those of you that have done that, not only should we turn to our Savior, but then let me offer this challenge. Tell your story. Turn to the Savior and then tell the story. It's that simple, that's our role in this world is to turn around and then tell people about that. I mean, you saw Scrooge, he could not keep quiet. When that much of a change happens in your life, when you do a 180, you start sharing that with people and you share it contagiously and excitedly. Matthew was no different. Let's take a look at his story. Matthew chapter nine, verse 10. This is right after the very next, the very same passage, you know, he calls, Matthew's at the tax collector's booth, and he calls to follow him, and then sometime later, although it's in the very next verse, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with Jesus and his disciples. Do you see what Matthew's doing there? Right, Jesus turns Matthew, but Matthew doesn't turn his back. Matthew does not turn his back on the people that that he's interacted with all his life. Matthew does not turn his back on the people that haven't yet met Jesus. Matthew doesn't, you know, sever ties with all those relationships, those redemptive opportunities that he could have. And he sets up this party at his house where he invites all those guys who are pretty bad dudes. And then he invites Jesus and these followers that used to be bad dudes and now they met Jesus. And, And Matthew gets them all mixing and mingling together. And somewhere in there, I guarantee you, Matthew is telling his story. Guys, I used to be driven by that greed. I'm not like that anymore. I'm a new person. I got to introduce you to the guy that made the difference. And they're probably asking him questions. And he's like, I don't know all that. I'm not sure. But you got to meet Jesus. Look at what he's done in my life. He could do this for you as well. Matthew's life takes a 180. And then Matthew tells that story. And he reaches out and he invites other people to find the same redemption that he's found. And he tells other people, hey, guys, your past, and I know your past. We all did that junk together, but your past doesn't have to last. Jesus is here to offer something more, to offer something better, to offer us the life that we're supposed to live. The life we used to live, the person that we are and and, and who we used to be, that's not who we have to be. Jesus offers something totally different. And as they go on, as Jesus and Matthew interact together, we get to this beautiful phrase in in, in verse 12. As Jesus has taken some heat for hanging out with these guys, he's taken some pressure for being with these tax collectors and these sinners. And then Jesus says this, hey, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
Jesus says, that's why I came. Which reminds me, did you hear about that doctor that, that fell in the well? I mean, it really serves him right. I mean, he should take care of the, he should take care of the healthy and leave the well, take care of the sick and leave the well enough alone. Yes. <laughs> All right, thanks. You're back with me now. All right. But Jesus, in essence, says the same thing. Jesus is going to leave the well enough alone. He's going to go after the sick. He's going to go after those who have a past. He's going to go after those who are tired of being the worst version of themselves. That's why Jesus came for all of us who've messed up, for all of us who get that glimpse of ourselves that we just don't like. Jesus came for us to offer us that healing, to offer us that redemption, to offer us that forgiveness. That's why he came so that he could bring about that change in Matthew's life and in yours. And so I would tell you this again, turn to the Savior and then tell your story. And really, it, it, some of you get all nervous about that and I'm right there with you. You know, we think about, you know, how am I gonna bring this up in conversation? How would I share that with someone? And I think we complicate that so much, far too much than it has to. Think about any other aspect of your life. Think about something that you're excited about, something that you tried and it worked and you saw some good results. You start telling people about it, right? Like, let's just say that, that I found some great diet, you know, and, and if I wanted to tell you about it, I would do it real simply. I'd say, boy, you know, I used to be like this. I used to weigh this much or have this much, you know, body fat or whatever it was I was not happy with. And then I tried this. And that was the turning point. And now check me out. You know, I'm a specimen, right? And, and uh, you know, all that. But it would be that simple, right? Or let's just say you, you were seeing a, you know, seeing a counselor or something. Boy, I used to have so much stress and so much anxiety. But then, I, you know, here was this connection. Some things started to change. And now I'm so much more at peace. I'm so much more relaxed. Or even, I mean, let's just get real ridiculous with it. Like you just got a new car. Like I used to have this old car and it was no good and here's what I didn't like about it. And then there was the turning point and now check out this car. You know, you would just tell it in, in pretty much those terms, right? Here's how things were before and then there was this shift and here's how things are now. And you wouldn't get all hung up on all the other questions like about the car. Let's go back to that one. Like, well, you know, you know how many cylinders does it have? I don't know, and you know, what's the MPG, and is it, you know, I don't even know the right questions to ask, but if people were to ask me lots of other questions about the car, I'd be like, I don't know any of that stuff. I'm just telling you, we used to have a CRV, and it was too small, because we had like three kids packed in the back seat, and the boosters are kind of hanging out the door, and now we have this minivan, and it's awesome, and I don't know any of the, don't worry, and you just would stick with those ideas, right? So why don't we do the same thing with our story about Jesus? Some of us, we get so wrapped up in like, well, what if they ask me questions that I don't know? And I don't really know the whole Bible just yet. And, and I don't know all, you know, I, what if, you know, what if they ask, don't worry about all that, right? What if you just, this simple, like before Jesus, here's how my life was. And really it stunk. I was this terrible version of myself and I was going nowhere. And then I met Jesus. And now, I don't know all the answers, but now my life is markedly different. And I've got this peace and I've got this contentment. And maybe they'll have some more questions for you. And you could say, I don't know, but why don't you come to church? We'll figure it out. Or I could get you those answers. Don't complicate it. Don't psych yourself out. Just tell your story. Here's what I used to be like. And then I met Jesus. And you know what he does? He gives people the chance to turn around. And my past doesn't have to last. And now I'm on a totally different trajectory. And, and I'd love that for you as well, if you'd like to learn more. Just tell your story. I, uh, Jason mentioned, or your campus pastors mentioned, that, that we don't, we're not meeting for services next weekend, but you do have homework, okay? So turn to the back of the note sheet there, because this is what I want you to do next week. I want you to figure out your story. I want you to just put a couple sentences to your story and honestly practice it. And think about, like, it could be one or two sentences for each of these bullet points. Like, what was your life like before Jesus? And Matthew would say, before Jesus, I was greedy and I was consumed with myself and just getting as much as I could get. And then I want you to come up with just a couple sentences about when and how you met Jesus. And Matthew would say, and then Jesus showed up and invited me to follow him. And then I want you to come up with a couple sentences about what your life is like since you've met Jesus. And Matthew would say, and now my life has purpose and I'm not greedy and I'm, I'm able to be generous and to give to others, right? Do you see how simple that could be? It's just three simple ideas, 
One or two sentences for each one. And I bet in your life, I bet there's some theme that would ride through that, right? Maybe like Matthew or like, like uh, Scrooge, your life used to be all about greed and then you met Jesus and now you overflow with generosity. Maybe your life used to be all about doing more and trying to please God and doing all these acts and works and then you met Christ and now your life is about grace and you realize that you're accepted for who you are. Maybe your life used to be all about image and making sure that you looked good and, and had all the things put together, and then you met Christ, and now you embrace your true identity in him. Maybe your life used to be all about fear and just nervousness, and, and, being a fr- and then you met Christ, and now you have joy. Or maybe there used to be stress, and then Jesus, and now there's peace. For me, honestly, my life used to be consumed with myself. Right? What, how can I make myself look better and be better and be the center? And then I met Christ. And now I'm still a work in progress, but my life is more and more about others and how I can love others, how I can connect with others. And, and maybe there's a theme to your life as well. And I challenge you to figure that out and to start to share it. And please don't psych yourself out with, yeah, but what if and this and that. And boy, you start sharing that story and watch what Jesus does. He changed your life. Now start to tell people about it just like Matthew did, just like Ebenezer Scrooge would have done if it was Jesus that had changed his life. But when there's a 180 degree change in our lives, we need to share that. And I want you to share that. I want you to tell your story because your story is worth sharing. And so take some time, work on that over the next couple of weeks. Email me your stories. I'd love to see that. I'd love to hear the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Because no matter what your story looks like, it it follows that same path. Because at some point, we come to this moment where we just don't like the version of ourselves. It's just not working. And we get to this point where this is not the me I want to be, and I have such good news for you. Your past, who you used to be, that greed or that fear or that stress or whatever, your past doesn't have to last. Who we are and who we used to be isn't who we have to be. Thanks to Jesus. That's why he came, to turn your life from the wrong direction to the right direction. I want to close with just a couple powerful quotes from Charles Dickens' book. He says this, he says, Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if persevered in, they must lead, said Scrooge. Do you see what he's saying? He says, the the course that I'm on, I kind of get a glimpse of where that's going to go. Right? And that path that you're on, whether it's in your relationships or with your generosity or you know, with your online addictions or whatever's going on, that path that you're on, you kind of get a glimpse of where that's going to lead. He says, men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which I, per- if persevered in, they must lead, said Scrooge. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. You can get off that course that's leading down a dead end. You don't have to continue to be the me you don't want to be. Your past doesn't have to last. Thanks to Jesus, you can change course. Your life can change directions. Your song can change, change keys. And then I love what Scrooge says as he gets to the end. And as he has this turnaround in his life, he makes this vow. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me, and I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. And he makes that commitment. And you know what? With just a few slight changes, it's a beautiful commitment for you and I. What what if we were to say it this way? I will honor Christ in my heart and try to keep him central all the year. I will invite Jesus into my past, my present, and my future. The spirit of God will strive within me, and I will not shut out the lessons that he teaches. God, may that be our prayer. May that be our promise, our commitment. As we conclude this year, as we look back and see several glimpses of times where we were certainly not proud of who we had become, and God, we praise you that we do not have to stay that way, that our past doesn't have to last. But thanks to Jesus, you offer, you offer hope, you offer renewal, you offer redemption, you offer a new life. And the me that we used to be isn't the me that we have to be. And we just praise you for that. 
And I ask that you would give us the, the wisdom, give us the determination, help us to continue to walk with you to become the people that you want us to be. Thank you for changing our trajectory. Thank you for changing our lives. And may we, may we be courageous enough to tell that story of what you've done in our hearts. We want to give you all the glory and all the praise. And we thank you so much for coming to save us. In your name, amen.